Hello, my name is Yossi Rappaport. I'm a reader in Islamic history at Queen Mary. This is my lecture for the Public History Unit on the Balfour Declaration, a century on settler colonialism in world history. History Unit event of the year. I, I'm pleased to welcome Queen Mary's own Dr. Yossi Rappaport. Uh, Yossi joined Queen Mary in 2007 and is a reader in Islamic history. His main research area is the social, legal and cultural history of the medieval Middle East. His previous work is focused on the controversial 14th century scholar Ibn Tamiya. Uh, his forthcoming book, co-authored with Emily Savage-Smith of Oxford University, is called Lost Maps of the Caliphs Drawing the World in 11th Century Cairo, and will be published in June next year. Over the last three years, he has convened a first-year team taught module on global history called Global Encounters, Conquest and Culture in World History. This innovative module examines case studies of colonial and pre-colonial encounters between conquerors and the conquered. The talk this evening, which marks the centenary of the Balfour Declaration, is a product of the collective effort of teaching on this module over the last three years. And so please welcome and enjoy it. Well. Um, thanks, Jack, for this introduction. Thanks for the, to the Public History Unit for hosting this. Thanks for, uh, to Patrick Higgins and Sam Bennett for making this happen. And I would like to thank the, all the faculty uh, who talked on the Global Encounters models over the last few years uh, that I've been very proud of. And this uh, lecture, which is outside my comfort zone of research area, is a result of the collective learning process that happens when you teach something. And it's been a real joy to be part of that model. Our topic today is the Balfour Declaration. Just to set us in context, the Balfour Declaration is a letter from Arthur Balfour, British Foreign Minister, uh, to Lord Rothschild, the representative of the Jewish community or Zionist community, uh, organization. It is, contains a promise to support the Jewish homeland in Palestine, which at the time overwhelming Arab speaking majority or Arab majority. It was issued during World War I on the eve of British conquest of Jerusalem from the Ottoman Empire. And the Balfour Declaration formed the guiding, was incorporated into uh, the mandate that Britain got, received from the League of Nations to administer Palestine in 1923. Three preliminary points for this lecture. First, in my view, under our current criteria of justice, the declaration is indefensible. As much as the Jews desperately needed the homeland or claimed Palestine as their ancient homeland, Britain had no right to offer Palestine to the Jews, to the Zionists, without the consent of the native population. My second preliminary point is that the Balfour Declaration was crucial to the Zionist project. British support for Zionism, enshrined in the 1923 mandate, over Palestine, allowed Zionist migration, formation of Zionist institutions in Palestine, and international legitimacy. The State of Israel would not have existed without the Balfour Declaration and without this British coup d'etat. <coughs> the third point is that this talk, the, my argument today, is that the Balfour Declaration should be understood within the framework 
of settler colonialism. Settler, coloni settler colonialism is an analytical tool or model used to explain the history of the United States of America, Canada, Australia, and South Africa. As such, I argue today that the Balfour Declaration and subsequent history of Zionist-Palestinian conflict have little that is specific to Jewish history, Islamic history, or Middle Eastern history. The patterns of the Zionist Palestinian conflict, beginning with the Balfour Declaration, correspond to wider global patterns of conflicts between European settlers or settler communities and indigenous populations. The structure of what I'm going to say is first, I'm going to give an, a relatively brief overview of the events leading to the uh, Declaration in 1917. <coughs> explore current explanations for the declaration and the motiv British motivations, and then present settler colonial model and how I think it best explains both the Balfour Declaration and the subsequent <coughs> history of the conflict. <coughs> at, the start of, uh, at the start of World War I, Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire. And it was an Islamic empire, uh, but also multi-ethnic and multi-faith empire, ruled uh, from Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, and Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire since uh, the early 16th century. As you can see on this map, it shrunk considerably over the 19th century, losing territories in the Balkans, as well as losing North Africa, and especially Egypt, which became a British uh, protectorate. When the Ottoman Empire joined um, the central powers of Germany and Austro-Hungary in the war, Britain attempted to, take, uh, to attack the Ottoman Empire at the beginning through Gallipoli, essentially, and then in Iraq. Both were much more difficult campaigns than the British expected. Their key objectives in the war in the Middle East were the protection of the Suez Canal, which was dug about 50 years earlier, uh, and, and uh, including the route, the, road, uh, the route to India, as well as the newly discovered oil in Iraq. As the British campaigns faltered in the Middle East, the British empl employed alliances with <coughs> Arab leaders, specifically the Sharifs of, uh, of the Hejaz, and this is uh, Lawrence of Arabia, who is organizing this. They are trying to organize an Arab rebellion against the Ottoman Turkish uh, regime. And in return for that rebellion, with which many of uh, Sharif Hussein's uh, soldiers paid with, uh, uh, with their lives, he was promised an Arab kingdom in the Middle East. At the same time, Britain entered negotiations with France, leading to what is known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, about the division of the Middle East, of the Ottoman Middle East after the war. They divided it in a secret agreement uh, in which Iraq would be under British control, Syria under French control, and Palestine to be under international. So two promises already were made by 1970. Zionism emerges in the 1880s in Eastern Europe as a national movement of Jews who are a minority in, in uh, Eastern Europe. It's a reaction to massacres of Jews uh, in Russia 
and it is associated with the secularization of the Jewish community at that time. Zionism was certainly not the only option. It competed with communism, with socialism, and with migration to Britain and to the United States, which were the most uh, popular options. Uh, immigration to Britain was curtailed in 1905 after the waves of migration here to the East End um, by the Alien Act of 1905, passed <coughs> by the British government, whose prime minister was, by the way, Arthur Balfour. So the Zionists made the claim that they need that the Jews need to return to the ancient homeland in Palestine. Since the early 1880s, there was a migration of small number of mainly Russian Jews. By 1914, the territory that became mandatory Palestine included about 700,000 <coughs> people, had a population of 700,000, of which 90% were Arabs, or Arabic speaking, most of them Muslim, with Christians mainly in the urban centers, and about 10% of the population were Jews, uh, <coughs> of which some were Jews that did not come as Zionists, but, but were there before. When in December 1916, Lloyd George becomes Prime Minister, the War Cabinet, Cabinet decides to enter a new front from Egypt. Egypt is British control. It survived an Ottoman attack through Palestine. It managed to repel the Ottomans, and now the War Cabinet decides to open a front attacking from Sinai towards Palestine. Lloyd George himself, in later memoirs, and his correspondence said that he thought at the time Zionism was a major power and Britain needed the support of the Zionists in order to win the war. Balfour, in his own memoirs and his own, and the things that he left us, was much more focused on the spiritual and religious aspect of it. And he famously said in 1919, Zionism, the return of the Jews to this promised land, is of much more importance, this far profounder import, than the desires of the 700,000 people who actually lived there. And they were lobbied by the uh, by the representative of the Zionist organization, Chaim Weizmann, uh, who was, uh, worked as a chemist in Manchester. The Zionists also faced opposition in the cabinet. Firstly, and most prominently, by the only Jewish member of the cabinet, Montague, who saw Zionism as a threat to English Jews. He wrote a memorandum in which he said um, that the Balfour Declaration uh, has an anti Semite effect, that it will encourage anti Semites all over Europe to throw Jews out of their, uh, out of their lands. You see how easily uh, claims, accusations of anti Semitism were thrown around even then. Um, Lord Curzon, the most exper experienced Middle Eastern uh, colonial officer, was worried about the implications for the population in Palestine, saying specifically, will the, may, will the indigenous population become servants of these Jews? What will happen to them? And remember, it's not only a question of promising the land to too many <coughs> to the Arabs and the French, it's, it's not only the duplicity of that, but it's really was about why are we causing ourselves these problems in the Middle East, arousing Muslim anger, making a quarrel with the French. What do we need this for? 
<coughs> and so the final declaration reflected the opposition in the cabinet. The final text is Jewish homeland in Palestine. There is no mention of return to the land. There's no mention of state. Protection for the civil and religious rights of the non-Jews. The Arabs are not given a name and they don't are not given political rights, but the civil and religious rights are to be protected. <laughs> And there's a guarantee that Jews in any other country, reflecting the opposition from Montague, will not be ad adversely affected by the And then Allenby, General Allenby, enters Jerusalem on foot, respecting the sanctity of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem we see here in the first act will come back to us in the final act of our lecture. This is key, that they wait, they wait before his entry to Jerusalem. They are already in Palestine, when the, the British forces are already in Palestine, the declaration is given, but they wait to give it before Allenby would enter Jerusalem. It is about Jerusalem. It's the key, it's not just the land, it's specifically Jerusalem. Okay, so that was an introduction to the events. How have modern historians explained the Balfour Declaration? I would say there are, th there are three main schools of thought. One cites the wartime exigencies. Balfour and others are cited as saying, we thought that the Jews in Russia will support us. There's a, at the same time, there's a Bolshevik revolution in Russia. In Russia, we know that the Bolsheviks are led by Jews. So we thought if we will issue that, then they will uh, be on our side and won't stop fighting the Germans. They thought the Jewish power in America will be uh, is so strong that this declaration will enlist their support. Or generally, there is a view that the supposedly inherited anti-Semitism uh, of, uh, of the British uh, elite means that they thought that the Jews have all this financial power. A second explanation focuses on Britain's strategic interest. Britain needed Palestine to protect the Swiss Canal. Britain needed Palestine to transport oil from northern Iraq, and therefore, the whole thing was just an opportunity to get its hand on Palestine. And a third explanation is that the Protestant education of people like Balfour and Lloyd George was crucial. And we do see that in the soldiers, in the diaries of soldiers writing from the Palestine campaign, that they are, we are coming to the Holy Land, to the biblical land. And this meant that they supported the return of the Hebrews as, uh, uh, as they saw in the Old Testament. I think all three explanations, while they are based in evidence of what, in what colonial British officials, government officials said, none of them are sufficient, not even together. First, some of them present the British policymakers as quite irrational. They're acting, well, in the rest of the empire, they're so cynical, suddenly here they become philanthropes and care about religious aspects and, and so forth. Or they have such an incomplete understanding of uh, international politics that they think that if they issue the Balfour Declaration, the Bolsheviks will not retreat from the war. Second, the British made three promises during the war. Why has that persisted? 
those explanations, like the wartime exigencies, don't explain why Britain stuck to this particular promise and incorporated it in, in the mandate of 1923. And more generally, and I think that's why the Balfour Declaration is centenary, it's such a wonderful opportunity to reflect on the conflict. Balfour Declaration is outside of the rest of the story. It's if, as if something strange happened during World War I, the Zionists see it as a miracle, as some kind of act of strange act of generosity by the British Gentile government. The Arabs see it as some kind of treason, and it has no connection to the rest of the story. So I'm trying to argue today that we have a model that can explain much better both the Balfour Declaration itself as well as the subsequent trajectory of the conflict. And that is the settler colonial model that has been developed in relation to specific countries, not Palestine. The United States of America, or North America more generally, Canada, Kenya, South Africa, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, Australia, New Zealand, Algeria and Ireland, I put it in the end, Algeria is the only non-British example, Ireland, because it's a bit of an earlier story, but uh, I do want to include both of them. How does the settler colonial model differ from mere colonialism? Settler colonial model is a model in which self-consciously European settlers come to settle permanently and in all these cases the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Algeria, they come to settle permanently and to establish their own political orders. They're not just immigrants. They see themselves as establishing a separate political order, often a utopian version of the order they left in Europe. Think of American uh, self uh, understanding. Settlers often come from, or from marginal European groups. Religious minorities, the Puritans, the Mayflowers, is the most famous example. The poor, the landless, and in the case of Algeria, as well as of course Australia, convicts who are sent by the European power to settle these lands, the ultimate marginals. The settlement is enabled by the conquest, by the British, in all these cases, say from the French, from, from Algeria, but it is a typical <coughs> aspect of settler colonial model that the settler communities seek independence from the metropolis. This is part of the story in all these cases. The key is, unlike other forms of colonialism, the objective is to the land, not the labor. <laughs> They may use native labor, but, the, but this is dispensable. The key is to acquire access, direct, direct access to the land, to settle on the land, in all these cases. And it requires as a side effect that the indigenous communities become minorities. Otherwise, the project cannot succeed. And they can become minorities only if you assume some kind of superiority over them. You can look at it that way. We have a triangle. The imperial metropolis 
allows or sends marginal groups to these new lands, these new lands. It offers minimal military investment. The point is that the beauty of the settler colonial uh, model from the point of view of London is that it's cost effective. You don't have to invest much. They will run themselves. And in return, you get a self-sustaining, paying for itself, loyal outpost, European outpost in a strategic place in the world. You have Australia, you have Canada, you have South Africa. The settler communities on the one hand expect this support, at least initial support from the imperial metropolis, but also want independence. And part of the reason they want independence is that their view of the indigenous community is different. Because for the settler community, in the cases of the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, and Algeria, for the project to succeed, the indigenous population has to become a minority. In some cases, it was luck. Native Americans died of disease, most of them first of all. But then, the settlers helped in expulsion, in driving out of the land, in all of those places. And when that was not enough, it was marginalization in the sense of not giving political rights. So South Africa is the best example of that. But of course, in all these cases, from the US to Australia, the indigenous population would, did not have political rights, they did not have voting rights in the 20th century. <coughs> the imperial metropolis has different view of the indigenous population. The imperial project means that British government sees itself, sees itself as some kind of protector of the people it occupies. Otherwise, it's part of that imperial project. So there's, there are different approaches, and this is part of the reason these communities want independent. There's always a tension between what how the metropolis views the indigenous communities and, and the settler community. And the indigenous community, not on this, uh, on this graph, the indigenous communities fight back as much as they can, and they fight it very brutally in all of these cases, with every, once it's clear where it's heading, they're fighting in whatever way they can against the settlers, and they ask for protection from the imperial metropolis, and they always feel betrayed. And the stages are also quite different. See how they cut it. The pattern is, is quite clear. Initially, when the settlers come, they are a minority. They need a lot of protection from the imperial metropolis, but they also need alliances with local indigenous communities. Thanksgiving, best example. And then they acquire land. It's not the exploitation of, of labor. This is the settler, the settler colony. It's about acquiring of the land, and acquiring land in a way that is a modern way. They acquire pro landed property in a way that disregards native indigenous users of the land, tribal, or, um, or in, for example, when people have rights over the land that are um, traditional, that are accepted as, uh, as part of ownership by tenancy. And the third stage, not by coincidence, includes two things. This is the big explosion. And they usually happen, it, they overlap to a degree. Is this 
trying to break away from the metropolis and a full conflict with the indigenous population. And it happens, it can be drawn out, like in the case of Australia or Canada. In the United States, there is one war of independence, but the process of fighting the indigenous population is longer. Algeria is condensed. And then there is a zero-sum conflict between the settler community and the, and the indigenous population. And it, the settlers don't always win. They lost in Kenya. They eventually lost in Odessa. And most famously, they lost in Algeria. In all these cases, they disappeared. Algeria, there were 100, 1 million uh, European settlers, about almost more than 10% of the population, and 800,000 of them after independence go back to France. And that's the end of the settler project in Algeria. But in the United States, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, a victory for the settler community, and once they managed to make the indigenous population a manageable remnant, then they can be integrated, given political rights, and be integrated into the new nation of Australia's community. Or America. <laughs> I think we've got the point, but just to make it clear. I think. By 1917, the success of the settler colonial model for the British Empire was evident. More than one million soldiers coming from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa fought for the empire. <coughs> It provided Canada, especially, provided so much of the raw materials for the British war effort. Britain couldn't have won the war without the dominions. And in April 1917, six months before the declaration, the government gives autonomy to these dominions. The British government, not to India. This is about we have these settler communities, dominions in strategic places. This has worked. Till today, the most successful legacy of the British Empire. And the British and realize it doesn't have to be British, it doesn't have to be Anglo-Saxons. They just won the war in South Africa. The Boers, the Dutch, are now included in the South African white nation, not the uh, indigenous population. The French of Quebec are now included in the Canadian national. You, have, you just need to be European. You don't have to be British to be part of that project. And the biggest supporter of Zionism in the media, the Manchester Guardian, who was campaigning endlessly for the declaration, said it clearly. That's what we need. That's the justification. We'll have a loyal ally to the empire. And in this crucial moment between 1917 to 1923, when that was on the balance of the Balfour Declaration. Will Britain actually act on it? A recent study <coughs> said this is the major argument made by the officials in the colonial office. They will be direct agents of empire. They will be loyal. They will be our, our key ally in the Middle East. And nicely in, in 1928, the 
uh, the most prominent Zionist in the Labour Party, Isaiah Wedgwood, writes the seventh dominion. This is what the Zionists will, will offer us, and we can make them the seventh dominion after uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and Ireland by that time, South Africa, two dominions. And I cite here, I took this from a recent article. The authors of this article, especially the one who talks about the official doom, saying the Zionists will become loyal allies, says, well, they were all deluded. I don't think so. I think Balfour was, more, was much more far-sighted than we've given him credit for. I think that the success of the settler colonies was at the back of the mind of British officials in 1970. This is a model that works and could work. And it worked first in the sense that we could have Palestine as a strong, self-sustaining ally on the cheap. You don't have to spend money because the immigrants, that the, that's part of the process. It's cost-effective, it's outsourcing. The British were worried about Jewish immigration to Britain. Balfour himself issued the Alien Act. All these Bolshevik Jews coming to the East End, some of them buried just outside this hall. If we can direct them somewhere else in the same way other religious minorities, marginal groups were directed outside. The great explosion of the Industrial Revolution meant that both British and French marginal groups were exported outside as a way to, to solve, to ease the pressure of what was happening inside. And this Tension in the declaration itself is typical of the problem of, me of the metropolis. It offers different things <laughs> to the settlers and the indigenous community. It's not, it's very typical to this tension. So I think this analysis allows us to connect Balfour to the rest of the story. It's no longer something uh, unique. And yes, settler colonialism explains the history of Zionism later on. <coughs> In 1917, it's dependent on the metropolis. It tries to make alliances with Sharif Hussein and others. At stage two, it marginal European immigrants come to Palestine by 1948, there are about 30 or 35 percent of the population, and they acquire land. They insist on not using native labor. The aim is to get land. And then, stage three classical. Independence from Britain is also the zero-sum conflict with the indigenous population, leading to expulsion of uh, about 700,000 Palestinian from It was not completed. Stage four never, never arrived. The conflict is life. Israel, a century onward, is still not sufficiently independent to make itself a successful project. Why is Israel not like Australia? It is a lot like Australia. It is a lot like Australia. It's a Western country with high standards of living, sunny, nice place to go for tourism, a regional superpower with representing the interests of the West in the region. 
but they are, it's not, it's not Australia. We're not <coughs> talking about it in the way we talk about Australia. And the reason for that is not because these are Jews and Arabs or Muslims or the Middle East, per se. The reason is that Israel did not succeed in making the Palestinians these manageable remnants. The refugees from 1948 were not settled elsewhere. The 1967 war meant more Palestinians than Israel could integrate into. And why did that happen? The 1967 war, as well as the non-integration of refugees, is because the Palestinians were stronger than expected. They were stronger than expected because Jerusalem, specifically, I think more than anything else, became the focus of wider solidarity in the way the Aboriginals in Australia never could hope. <coughs> and this, I think, this is the main thing. The Palestinians put too difficult than. Uh, than what Balfour expected. Balfour really expected that they will disappear or in a minority group uh, quite naturally. Zionism is also limited in that because it presents itself as returning to the land, it is also focused on the territory. It focuses on Jerusalem again specifically. And that makes it more difficult for them to be flexible in the way Australian or Canadian colonists could decide, well, if somewhere is too difficult, we leave it out. Then we need Jerusalem as justification. Today, incomplete settler colonialism, the state of Israel is for the last 50 years, in control of the entire territory of British Palestine, Mandatory Palestine. In that territory, there are six and a half million Jews, nearly all descendants of Zionist immigrants. The same number of Palestinians, a third of them with citizenship rights in Israel, the rest without citizenship residents in a similar way to the model that was in South Africa. <laughs> And there are far the three and a half million Palestinian Arabs who are refugees outside the territory. What's the future? The most likely outcome so far in history <laughs> has been zero sum conflicts. That's unfortunate, but that's the most common outcome. That one group is disappears. At the moment, we are not prophets, historians shouldn't be. At the moment, it seems that neither side can make the other disappear. <coughs> Israel marginalizes the Palestinians, doesn't give, most of them don't have uh, voting rights, many cannot return to the land, but the, prof but the conflict is alive, they have not disappeared, they are not manageable. Partition is not a common outcome for this conflict. There are good reasons for that. It was only tried in Ireland. I didn't talk about Ireland, and it wasn't very successful either. I think that everything so far suggests that it is impossible to completely divide the land. We come back to Jerusalem. Both projects are focused on Jerusalem. You cannot divide that place, you cannot divide the rest of the country. We are left with the South African model. The only place where a settler community try to do something different. And I'm not just saying one state. Or the point, I'm not saying it that way. I'm thinking in the sense of a settler community and a minority in the Jews in Palestine are effectively a minority, now as well, I think. 
need to imagine a future in which they can defend their interests without having monopolies over political right of power over situation. <coughs> Not a specific model of South Africa, which is just conceiving of such future that we uh, a century on to think of. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, came into that. Um, so you said the um, sorry, I just put that one. Uh, in the, the, the you were arguing about the three main schools of thought about the motivation behind the declaration, and you said that they were reliant on the idea that the declaration was sort of an irrational act that wasn't in line with British policy concerning the, um, the conflict and the situation. But um, it seemed so beforehand the British were rather unlikely, were um, not in favour of it at the start of the war. It's only when you get Lloyd George and Balfour and this combination in the war cabinet that it happens. And after the declaration, the Zionists had to really push the British to keep them supporting their promise in the declaration to put it into the League of Nations mandate of Palestine. And in the 1930s, you saw a British policy of trying to restrict Jewish immigration to Palestine. So, what would your response to that be? Thank you. That's a good question. The British were playing with the idea of Zionism before, and of course, Zionists came with Uganda and other places. So the idea of having Zionists settle somewhere is a, what I think I am proposing is a European <coughs> settler colony was there before the war. The war opens possibilities that were not there before. It could have Uganda, but, but the Zionists didn't really, really want it and the British had other reasons. The war just opened the possibility. I think they stuck with that promise until the middle, the, as you said, until the 1930s, when the more wider Arab support for the Palestinian cause was in the way of the British preparation for World War II. So it's really that the weight of Arab opposition that seems much more important in the late 30s that made Britain change its mind. So that's how I would answer that. Christian. The theory of the center theory is very persuasive. But one wonders sometimes whether leaders are rather irrational, and certainly the generation of Balfour and the generation of his age, they you know they made trips to Palestine you mentioned the, the Protestant <coughs> endeavor, the Holy Land, Jerusalem, you know, the anthem of this country, you know, the Holy Jerusalem. All that is highly irrational. So it is imaginable that they were irrational. And I just wondered whether, for your center theory, you find in within the laying down of political strategy any confirmation of your highly persuasive theory. Uh. I bring here one answer is that I think these people sometimes acted irrationally, but generally, generally over time, imperial policy corrects itself. So you could be, you could have one, but because I link the Balfour Declaration to a wider process, I think that. Seeing that as just that, all of the things that I mentioned, they said, and some of it they believed, they not only said, but I still think that there's a pattern that is stronger than the individual. And coming back to the model of global encounters, that's what this model taught me, this global history. So this comparative history, you see patterns that just working on your particular case, you don't see. And I, so this is my other coming to it from the comparative perspective. I, and I also didn't work on that, but as, as Jack said at the beginning, I'm not I'm not a historian of that period. So maybe more people will find will find this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
seeing <coughs> that the only way forward to potentially see the situation is a state solution uh, on the Palestinian. Yeah. As in South, Af South Africa is a model of one state solution. I try to qualify that by saying the key is to imagine a future in which the settler community preserves its interests without having monopoly over power and situation. So I, I think I, my personally, but this is not as historical as you just can say. Uh, I personally more likely, I think, are some kind of binational solutions like a confederacy or Belgian style federation, where you have Brussels in the middle, Jerusalem, that would hold Belgium together, and two uh, federal states. So that could be, or a confederacy of two states. So I think that is more likely, but the, I'm not, this is not the point here. I just think you have to see it of how a settler community can imagine itself equal with the indigenous. So you talked about um, the incomplete settler colonialism and how it's your manifesto for a state for a sort of dependent upon washing, which is kind of like imperial metropolis. So I know it's kind of speculation, but in your opinion, what was I don't know specifically the United States, but I, yes. but I think that the, the model suggests that as long as the settlement colonial project is not complete, the colonists need international support. Uh, hi, once thanks uh, for the science and uh, a few weeks ago it was Nathan Yahya who said that he's not sure if Israel will be back in 30 years. And settler colonialism, as you know, has also cast report in the anthropology of this scholar's work. It's a zero sum game, and they studied the case of Palestine as a settler colonial case. So uh, why don't you think that? Most likely it would be the Algerian example or the Israel example because, for instance, as you know, for settler colonialism, land, geography, and demography are extremely important. As you rightly said, indeed, it's not Australia, uh, but that also can make it Algeria. For instance, by 2020, Palestinians will outcome Israel and settler colonialism in Palestine. <coughs> And by 2045, the, the percentage will be like 60 40. So, don't you think at the end of the day, um, <coughs> even though as it's a settler colonial uh, case, but most likely it will be more relevant to the settler colonial cases of the 19th and 20th century, like Algeria, for instance? That's it for me. I, again, I'm I'm a historian, I'm not a prophet. And, no, but, but I really, I, I mean it in the sense that uh, you know, either exodus or ethnic cleansing are on the table as, an, as a human being, as a committed people who cares about this place. I think both outcomes will be catastrophic tragedy. Algeria is a less happy place than South Africa. Um, and of course, the number in Algeria was one million, we're talking six million Jews. This is in Algeria, it was exodus. They didn't have to leave most of them. Uh, settler communities have a problem of actually imagining equality. So it's not just about expansion, it's about imagining a shared future, imagining a scenario different than the zero cost. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you just mentioned the idea of imagining um, an outcome that's different to the zero sum conflict. And I was wondering, you slightly moved it down by saying, um, so set minority should explore ways or interests beyond the of your political rights and uh, power and citizenship. But surely, isn't that not the primary aim of both the setting of these and the cessions? Um, is there any way of imagining anything other than that? So, Sakuta is an example that, that he said that about the uh, His mom then wrote that about the So, I think that gives us hope that there is a different way. It doesn't have to be exactly the same process, but it gives us hope the settlers can see themselves different. I would say, as you know, people are <coughs> more complicated than in the caricature. They change. And the desire of the settler is to become native. And in that process, he or he changes. So it opens up possibilities. That's how I hope we should have Fine, Nelson. Uh, I think you know what I'm going to ask. Yes, yeah, thank um, you. I'll ask it anyway. Um, given your idea of this being a set of colonial model and the most likely outcome being the zero sum conflict, how Father, do you believe Palestinians are justified in defending themselves against a very powerful state that treats its prisoners in their own native land and intends to form the work of our Okay, so prepare my answer. <laughs> Historians make, don't make necessarily good politicians. You ask a political question. <laughs> Netanyahu is the son of a very good historian, by the way. Um, what I can say, not as a historian, but as a committed individual, is that obviously there are injustices that need to be resisted. As a committed individual, I think that resistance should be both moral and effective. In my view, the boycott, the investment, and sanctions is both moral and effective. I think that this is not should not be imposed. But I hope my colleague, a lot of you here, will gradually also take that. Thank Too many people over the last few weeks told me, what are you doing? Why are you opening this? Are you crazy? <laughs> <coughs> we place, I completely agree, we place too much emphasis on who is saying. If this was in a labor fringe, if this talk was in a labor fringe event or by a woman with a Muslim name, the headline would have been easy. I, but we are having it here. And if we continue, let's silence ourselves about it. 
I know it's difficult and it's easier for me as Israeli Jew to speak and that's why I'm speaking to you and people watching you I know more perhaps in the topic but I still think you should keep talking about it, not being silenced there's <coughs> What? Okay. I was fearing that. I was thinking about your schema. And to be provocative, this is not one of your points to your lecture that you kind of both obsessed about possible. That whilst the Zionist project may be incomplete, it nevertheless the past that should be found below and actually the kind of key. Foundation stone of the Israeli state is the War of Independence, therefore, in 1948, in the same way as the Israeli American analogy, the sort of foundation moment for the United States, the War of Independence, in the late 18th century, thus kind of consolidated as the heart of the American nation movement. The analogy, therefore, being in 1948, is not the Israeli state. So, I guess, yeah, in terms of your scheme, perhaps you can repeat, as you say, the conversions that are here. Ask sufficiently far down the road, but it's my of time will happen at the end of that. And one of the unusual things about this is that it's kind of the last, last of the important summer in this project. Uh, and the second question, which is shorter, uh, which is just uh, what do you think all this says about the relationship of settlerism, contemporary settlerism, to Zionism? I assume that your key theory is in the visible. Um, well, I, I don't agree with the 1948. I think that only when you start with Mayflower to understand America proper. Um, not, at the end, the War of Independence, ultimately in America, is is a blip. You know, it's hasn't affected, you know, it be they became independent, but they're part of the same world, and it didn't affect the situation of the Native Americans there. Uh, so, I actually think that focusing on either 1948 or 1967 obfuscates, um, obfuscates the longer process that really starts with Balfour. As I said, right at the beginning, without Balfour, there's no state of Israel in life. Um, and South Africa and Algeria are also late, by the way. Algeria proper colonization in the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, South Africa becomes a dominion, becomes part of the British Empire, literally just before the World War I. So it's not that unusual. Um, in terms of uh, other dominions in Israel, Australians and Canadians, we have a few Canadians here in the Gandas. We noticed that the Global Encounter people, the teaching on the Global Encounter module, all come from dominions, including the Zionist dominion. And I think that's not a coincidence that there's a reflection by Canadians, New Zealanders, about, as they say sometimes, living in stolen land that is similar to Zionist reflections in that way, and of course not. <coughs> Can I just ask, that was a question really, I was just thinking about the comparison between uh, you know, the idea that the, the settlers need to, in some kind of way, eliminate, incorporate, deal with, as it were, people they find. And you, if you take, you know, if you take Israel, uh, sorry, if you take Algeria, South Africa, Kenya, which are three of your examples, and then Israel, it does seem to Israel, and I don't know how real it is, that in the French Algeria, in South Africa, the, the, the dominated community had really no civic, serious civic rights. They had no votes. They had, whereas the, what the problem, one thing was that it seemed there was. Uh, whatever proportion of Palestinians who had um, from 48 to uh, for, for, well, maybe not theoretically full rights, I'm sure, in many ways, forms of discrimination. And that really the caesura in some way comes after the 67 war, 
where you get the incorporation of um, millions of Palestinians who don't have any rights because they're not actually Israeli citizens. And that's really the, and so in a sense the model, uh, I'm trying to put a more uh, optimistic spot, spin, if you want, on the, you know, the, 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 the way in which the, the original Zionist model tried to, and of course there was the exodus or the expulsion, which is another, so you've got two things, you've got the expulsion, of course they don't have any rights, they've got no rights anywhere. But there are the, there is a, it seems to be a slightly different model of assimilation of dealing with the problem at all. And my other sort of general thing is just, I suppose it follows on from what Martin was saying, it does seem to be your problem, I just sort of feel that I don't know enough about the gestation of Alpha to know whether the, the Balfour Declaration, you know, and I know very little about it. It did seem to me you were, you were implying a more kind of consistent rationality to the British government class that moment than I sort of feel it really had. I'm not, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it was done in a fit of absent mindedness, but I wonder whether you, 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 in a slightly different way from what Martin said, you ascribed too much importance to that moment. I accept that it sort of made it possible, but a huge amount of the weight of your argument implies a kind of imperial rationality. And I don't know whether you're perhaps exaggerating that. Um, yeah, so 1967 war, <coughs> most you know, governments would now say this is the this is the moment. It's really about 1967. Israel existed only 19 years in that form, <coughs> and 50 years. But in terms of the process, the 1967 war happened not because of Israel. It happened because Israel was not accepted as legitimate by the Palestinians and their allies because they saw it as a settler community. It didn't just happen in 1967. It happened because it was not... Israel wanted to be exactly that, that complete settler community that gives citizenship to the Palestinian who remained. It was a manageable remnant. But it didn't work because the Palestinians and their allies rejected it after 48. And you know, Israel would have agreed to peace in 1948 on that border. The problem is the problem is the Palestinians did not did not agree then. And I feel that any resolution that doesn't look at the process as a whole from 1917 will not, even if it was on the table, will not satisfy their narrative of the story. In terms of rationality, that's what uh, Christian asked as well. While I don't think they uh, yes. <clears throat> Always rational. I, I think we don't give enough weight to the success of settler communities. We tend to talk of colonialism as something that passed, and we tend to think of of exploitation. But the most evident successes of settler communities just in front of our eyes, are hidden because they're so hopeless. And in some way, I think that this is what happens there. These people, even, I do think that even if they don't articulate it, the same set of assumptions and processes that led them to send convicts to Australia are telling them this is the best solution for the Zionists, for Palestine and the Zionists. Even if they don't say, even if they don't articulate it their mind, but it, it follows the same pattern and it is extremely successful. So, whether Balfour was rational or not, definitely for me, as someone who's not a historian, but to say, that because I'm a medievalist and I don't have archives, 
I'm forced to work with patterns. I'm forced to work with patterns in a way that people who have were more luckier than me uh, are perhaps doing too. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.